sit anywhere. Definitely died. Okay, so now I've got you. Good afternoon. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to the 49th uh, Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. Um, uh, happy to see so many. Uh, um, usual faces and also uh, um, a large smattering of people I don't recognize. And uh, that's always a positive thing every year to see how many um, new uh, uh, scientists are coming into our field. Um, we've got a jam-packed uh, program for you today. Um, I do want to um, uh, uh, introduce a, a special um, item this morning this afternoon, sorry. <laughs> it's one of those days. <laughs> um, uh, this is our seventh year here at the Woodlands, and uh, um, we have a uh, special presentation from uh, Mr. John Anthony Brown. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the Woodlands Township. Uh, my name is John Brown. I am the Woodlands Township Board of Directors. I'm also the Vice Chair of Visit the Woodlands. And it's an honor and a blessing um, to be here today with you. And I am so um, honored that you're enjoying um, the, this conference. And I also like to hope, I also hope that you're enjoying the fantastic weather I had prepared for all you today. <laughs> I, we really want to thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for uh, choosing the Woodlands Township. And to quote my daughter's favorite book, we love you to the moon and back. <laughs> thank you. I have here uh, a proclamation from the Woodlands Township and the Visit the Woodlands, uh, Visit the Woodlands that I would like to read, with, read to you. Be it proclaimed, whereas the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference jointly organized by the Lunar and Planetary Institute and NASA Johnson Space Center brings together international specialists in petrology, geochemistry, geophysics, geology, and astronomy from around the world to present the latest results of research in planetary science. And whereas the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference is the premier planetary science conference in the world, since its beginning in 1970, when it was called the Apollo 11 Lunar Science Conference, the meaning has been a significant focal point for planetary science research. And whereas nearly 1,800 planetary scientists and students representing 41 countries attend the conference each year, and whereas despite the growth of the conference over the years, the Lunar Planetary Science Conference remains a community-focused conference fostering a collegial environment in which the discussion of relevant scientific and technological issue aims to advance understanding of the solar system and promote scientific discovery. And whereas, in honor of the Lunar and Planetary Institute's 50th anniversary and anticipation of the Lunar and Pla Lunar Planetary Science Con Conference's 50th anniversary in 2019, the Woodlands Township and visit the Woodlands would like to offer our sincere gratitude for continually choosing the Woodlands to host this cutting edge conference. Now therefore, on behalf of the Chairman of the Board of the Directors, Mr. Gordy Bunch, and Bruce Reeser, Chairman of the Visit the Woodlands, we here do hereby proclaim March 19th, 2018 through March 23rd, 2018 as Lunar and Planetary Science Days. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Now I'd like to go ahead and uh, have the Dornick Award winners uh, presented. Thank you, Eileen. 
So uh, for those of you who don't know, Stephen Dwornick was a longtime member of our community. He was involved in the programmatic side of NASA. Uh, he volunteered to serve in World War II at the age of 17 and received, he fought in the Battle of the Bulge and received the Bronze Star for his service. Uh, so he came from a time in the U.S. when we were of uniform opinion that Nazis were bad. <laughs> you gotta, get, you gotta get, get back there. Yeah. And uh, in 1991, he set up this, this endowment to, to provide some incentive for the students to, to furnish, to help, uh, help the next generation of students. And it's been, it's been going strong since. We've, been, we've expanded it to include U.S. citizens at, uh, non-U.S. citizens at U.S. institutions as of a few years ago. And as of last year, the students will actually receive some, some written feedback as to how they're doing. So to help it be more of a growth uh, for all participants, both judges and students. And I have to advance my own slides. There we go. Okay, so get right to it. So our first winner, honorable mention for undergrad talk, uh, Ms. Carol Hundle from Wesley College. <laughs> and she might be a bit, a bit slow getting back from lunch. Oh, there she is. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. So our advisors are Matt Gollenbeck and Ingrid. Uh, the best undergraduate talk, Allison McGraw from the University of Arizona. And the next two individuals couldn't be here, but um, Isabel King from Harvey Mudd College, honorable mention for undergrad poster, and Emma Sosa from Lafayette College. And so part of the the uh, impetus for this award for undergraduates is to convince them to stay in our field. So we're only batting about 50% here. So we, <laughs> we, get, we gotta do better next year. Moving on to the graduate students, honorable mention for graduate poster, Ms. Hannah Kaplan from Brown University. Uh, Tess Caswell, best graduate poster, also from Brown University. Congratulations, Tess. Kevin Cannon, uh, honorable mention for graduate talk, also from Brown University. Congratulations, Kevin. And for the clean sweep, R. Tarek Daly, best graduate talk, also from Brown University. So, Tarek couldn't be here today. My understanding is his wife just had a baby a week ago, so he's excused from this. Uh, and so, you know, that's a lot of brown on the slides here. So if your school has Arizona in its name, you've got to pick up your game next year. Um, and uh, please, if you would, please extend a special round of thanks to the judges. This is all volunteer. It's not myself and, and we're just the coordinators. It's, it's the judges who volunteer their time every year, time in and time out, to view hundreds of students. So please thank the judges for their hard effort. And we had uh, some, we also have plaques here for the Pellis Writer Student Paper Award. So this is a joint award for, uh, this is the 217 award, so it was for 2016, the best paper. And this is joint between uh, uh, Pellis and Writer, so esteemed scientist and esteemed practical joker, Graham Writer. And uh, so the, the winner of that, James Keene from the University of Arizona, now at Caltech. Scientist and artist, excellent. And then the, this was a this was a co-prize this year. Uh, this presenter couldn't be here. Uh, Garrett Buddy from uh, Munster couldn't be here, but also a co-winner of the Polish Rider. Thank you, Brad. Uh, and we now have also the uh, Parazzo International Student Travel, Mark Sykes. We have a slide, I thought, but you do have. Yeah, we did have a slide. Oh well. Okay. Yeah, well, we'll find it at some point. There we go. Uh, I'm Mark Sykes. I'm CEO of the Planetary Science Institute. Uh, this is the fifth year that PSI has awarded the Pirazzo International Student Travel Award. 
uh, uh, Betty Perazzo uh, was a senior scientist, PSI, known impact uh, scientist, but also a strong proponent of international collaboration. And, and, uh, and so this award was established to support that in uh, providing a, a, a prize to uh, a, a foreign grad, a non-U.S. graduate student come to a meeting in, in the United States, and LPSC seems to be the most popular one that people want to come to, uh, and for a U.S. graduate student uh, to go to a meeting outside of the United States. And so uh, this year, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to announce that our awardee is Lauren E. McCown from, and I'm sorry if I'm didn't do your name right, uh, from Trinity University for her work on a quantitative comparison between theory and experiment for CO2 sublimation on a granular surface under terrestrial and Martian conditions and morphological results. So, Okay, and then I'd like to uh, turn it over to um, my co-sponsor, uh, Louise Proctor, the director of the LPI. Thanks, Eileen. Okay, um, can I ask the Early Career Fellowship winners to stand up, please? You're distributed through the audience. Come on, there are 20 of you. Come on, thank you. All right. <laughs> I just want to say a few, a few words about why they're standing up and why we're applauding them. Um, each year, the Lunar and Planetary Institute gives out a number of travel awards to deserving students from across the globe. So to win one of these awards, the students are judged on the, quant the quality of their abstract, or abstract, some of them had two, uh, their academic record and letters of reference. Um, it's extremely competitive, uh, but selection can, in some cases, make the difference between attending the LPSC or not. And as many of you know, coming to this conference can make a huge difference in your career, your career path. Um, so it is a big deal. Um, this year, we were able to expand the number of awards a little um, and reach more into some less well-represented communities. And for those that count, we have 10 men and 10 women, so it's very equitable. So we're happy about that. <laughs> Um, their names are up on the screen. I'm not going to read them out, but you can see who they are. And um, once again, just let's thank, uh, congratulate them on winning this prestigious award. <laughs> okay. okay, and now, without further ado, we're actually going to get on to the Mazursky Lecture. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole of Linda's biography because I want to give her more time to speak. Um, but uh, you'll, you can read it in the program, but essentially uh, she has been in our field for her whole career. She started out on the Voyager mission. Uh, what was that, 70? 41 years ago. Oh, 77. Quite, yeah. quite a long time ago. Um, <laughs> And in um, 1990, she joined the Cassini mission and has been the project scientist on Cassini since 2010. Um, but she is an expert on the evolution and dynamics of Saturn's rings. And with uh, Cassini being you know, one of the most successful flagship missions, I mean, it really showed the value of a flagship mission. Um, and we're very sorry to see its demise, but it made some incredible discoveries. Yeah. And we're very uh, pleased to welcome Linda Spilker. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Louise. And it turns out I actually started working on Cassini before it was even a mission. In fact, I've worked on Cassini for almost 30 years. If you think about it, that's the time it takes Saturn to circle the sun a single time. And in fact, my oldest daughter, Jennifer, had just started kindergarten when I started working on Cassini. And now she's married with a daughter of her own. So how time flies. It just goes by so quickly. Uh, but Cassini's findings have truly revolutionized our understanding of Saturn, of the complex ring system, of the incredible assortment of moons, and the dynamic magnetosphere. Its 13-year epic journey around Saturn has rewritten textbooks, quite literally. And we have some new books coming out shortly about Cassini's findings. Well, you'll see up on the screen one of my very favorite pictures. This is a solar eclipse picture. Only a spacecraft could get this picture. It's Saturn covering up the sun. And we did this just a handful of times in the mission. And what you can see is the sunlight shining through and forward scatter illuminating the tiny grains, Saturn's main rings, the white F ring just outside of it, G ring, and then this magnificent blue E ring 
created by the tiniest particles coming from Enceladus. And if you look carefully at Saturn, you'll see the sunlight refracted completely around the disk of Saturn in that white line. And if you think about it, you're looking at every sunrise and sunset on Saturn at the same time. So truly a remarkable image. And then you can actually see that there's light on the night side of Saturn, and that's light reflected off the ring. So just a, an iconic image from Cassini. Well, here's a view of the Cassini spacecraft and the uh, European-provided Huygens probe. The Cassini spacecraft is about two stories tall. To give you an idea of its size, that white dish antenna at the top is about four meters in diameter. And then you can see the Huygens probe uh, is covered with these gold blankets to protect it as we went in toward Venus, and then the heat shield underneath. And you can see people for scale. Fully fueled at launch, including the Huygens probe, Cassini weighed about six tons. And so we sent it on its way to Saturn. Here's an overview of the Cassini mission <coughs> against that 30-year orbit of Saturn. You can see that the Cassini mission got started in 1990 with the selection of the instruments. Uh, we are then launched in 1997 after a seven-year development, and it took us seven years to get to Saturn. We had a flyby of Venus, two of the Earth, and a gravity assist of Jupiter arriving at Saturn in mid-2004. We initially had a four-year prime mission funded by NASA. And that was followed by a two-year Equinox mission with the rings edge on to Saturn, and then a seven-year Solstice mission. And at the very end of that, in the last year of the mission, we had a series of remarkable orbits at high inclination, including some that dove in between the rings and the planet, a brand new mission returning science from Cassini. So I'd like to go through some of the highlights of the mission. Oh, here, here's an overview. If you look at the top panel, uh, those are the orbits for each of the years. You, you'll notice we had 127 flybys of the giant moon Titan. And not only was it a very interesting target, but we also used it to shape the inclination and orientation of our orbit throughout the 13-year tour. Initially, we had three Enceladus flybys in the prime mission, but the findings with Enceladus were so incredible, we added 20 more flybys. In fact, Enceladus became a target, a focus, for us in the extended missions. And seven of those actually flew through the plume of Enceladus to sample and taste and return information directly about the composition. We had 15 close targeted flybys of the other icy moons of Saturn and also some additional flybys of the, the tinier inner moons, and then those final 22 orbits at the end of the mission. Now we arrived at Saturn just two years after northern winter solstice, and we noticed a bluish northern hemisphere. And you can actually use the rings like a sundial, the ring's shadow like a sundial on Saturn. Equinox, the rings are a thin line at the equator, and as the mission progressed, the ring shadow moved into the south as it became southern winter. And here's the view we saw in the northern hemisphere, a very bluish atmosphere, that golden haze had dissipated, and it kind of had a Neptune blue color to it. And so this was surprising because the Voyager flybys were much closer to the equinox of Saturn. And you can see the rings at the bottom and the tiny moon Mimas in this image as well. Then as the seasons changed and the ring shadow moved into the south, slowly that golden color came back to the northern hemisphere. And you can see in the south that that bluish color is now appearing in the south as well. And in the front there, the giant moon Titan is visible against the disk of Saturn. Here's a view of Saturn and its rings. You can see Saturn's shadow going out and covering the rings. And one of Cassini's remarkable findings was to actually study, you can notice that greenish feature, it's a six-sided jet stream, a hexagon at the north pole of Saturn. It was first detected by the Voyager spacecraft in the early 1980s when Cassini arrived in 2004. It was still there and it's, it's long lived. Here's a close-up view of it. It's about two Earth diameters across. It truly forms a boundary in Saturn's atmosphere. You can see that blue-greenish color, the smaller haze particles inside the hexagon, and the golden haze outside of it at this particular time of year. Here you can see in this false color movie that the clouds rotate at different rates inside the hexagon. The hexagon itself also rotates and spins off these uh, very interesting structures around its edge. Uh, to our knowledge, it's the only six-sided structure like this in our solar system. You don't have a hexagon at the south pole of Saturn. 
Uh, if you look very carefully at the center, uh, Cassini discovered a giant hurricane. And this false color image we've nicknamed the rose. Here's the hurricane. The sun is coming in from the right. You can see the shadows from the eye wall. This hurricane is about 50 times larger than a typical Earth hurricane and would span about half the continental United States. So it's truly huge in size. Wind speed's about four times faster. Sometimes you're at the right place at the right time. And that happened with Cassini. We actually got to see a giant planet engulfing storm develop at the end of 2010. A huge vortex then spawned a large tail. And over nine months, that tail wrapped itself around the planet until the head and the tail came together, and that marked the end of the storm. Now, if you look at this storm in different wavelengths, if you go to the near infrared, there you can see in green that vortex that was the source of the storm. That's higher up. The reddish colors are deeper in the atmosphere, and the tail as it goes around the planet. It turns out a tremendous amount of energy was released, and these storms only occur about once every 30 years. This particular storm came 10 years early. And so Cassini was at the right place to observe it along with our ground-based observers and watch the evolution of this storm. Such a tremendous amount of energy was released in the storm that it punched its way up into the stratosphere. If you look into the far infrared, which measures the temperatures, that spot looking like a giant eye was actually 80 Kelvin warmer than the surrounding atmosphere. And some unique atmospheric chemistry occurred in that particular eye, and it very slowly cooled after the storm. So it was one of the last things to fade away as the storm ended. Well, one of the things Cassini found was that we really didn't know the rotation rate for Saturn after all, for the internal rotation of the planet. It turns out that the Voyager discovered Saturn kilometric radiation. We thought that this period was a proxy for the internal rotation rate of the planet. Cassini arrives, and what do we find? We find that there are actually two SKR periods, one in the north and one in the south, and neither one was the Voyager period. So uh, or already, we're, that's telling us that there's something else going on. So it appears that the, the source of this SKR is probably Saturn's auroral regions, and it's not telling us about the internal rotation of the planet. Now, in the grand finale orbits, uh, we were able to look with our uh, mag magnetospheric instruments, in particular with the magnetometer, to try and get a sense of the interior rotation because we're looking for a slight offset between the spin axis and the magnetic field axis. And it turns out in other more recent results that that angle between them is down to less than 0 0.008 degrees. So in this case, very unusual, it appears that the magnetic field axis and the spin axis are co-aligned. And so we're continuing to look at the data, but it, it's just they're getting very, very close together. Here's Saturn's rings. They have very simple names. The A ring, B, C, and D. The F ring is just outside the A ring. G ring, and then the, the E ring created by Enceladus. There are also some gaps in Saturn's rings. In particular, there's a, the Enki gap in the A ring and the Cassini division, and that's named after the astronomer who discovered it, and also is the name of our mission. Now, these rings are inc incredibly complex and dynamic. Here's just one view. There are many of these resonances in the rings that create these spiral density waves. The physics for spiral density waves is similar to the physics for a spiral galaxy. So in this case, a two to one density wave would be like a two to one, a two armed spiral galaxy very, very tightly wrapped in Saturn's gravitational field. And so every other wave is one of those arms of the spiral galaxy. It turns out that uh, Janus shares an orbit with a smaller moon, Epimetheus, and their orbits are so close together, they cannot physically pass one another because of their size. So instead, when they get close together, the innermost one drops back, and the outermost one goes into the front, and they just switch orbits in a very complex dance. And when they do that, you can actually see a glitch in between these waves. So these waves actually record the history in Saturn's rings. And if you look at the upper left-hand corner, those waves were launched at the time of the Voyager flybys. There are also some objects in the rings that are, are not quite big enough to completely open up gaps. We call them propellers. There are small objects in the middle that are creating these two-arm propellers as they try and open up a gap. And they have nicknames of aviators, so very appropriate for uh, propeller names. You see Blériot and Earhart and Santos Dumont. 
And by studying them on each side of the rings on the lit and the unlit sides, we can tell where the gaps they're forming are and where there are more dense particles. And we are very interested in these objects. They migrate back and forth in the rings slightly. And they are proxies for what perhaps the protostellar disk looked like from which the planets formed. So by studying these propeller objects, we might get clues toward how planets formed in our own solar system. They come in a range of sizes. The tiniest propellers are on the lower right. There are actually three belts of propellers in Saturn's rings. Perhaps there are shards left over from the process that formed the rings. Here's what Saturn's rings look like at equinox. You've essentially turned off the sun, and so we've had to enhance the brightness in the rings here, a factor of 30 on the lit side and a factor of 60 on the unlit side so that you can see them and you can see the, the F ring glowing. And in particular, what we were looking for is anything that sticks up above or below the rings, they're on average only about 10 meters thick, would cast shadows. So we were looking to see, was the ring disk warped? Could we see any larger objects or anything else going on in the rings? It turns out the rings weren't warped. They're perfectly flat in Saturn's equatorial plane. But if, we, if you look very carefully at the outer edge here of the B ring, the brightest ring, what we did see was a whole host of long shadows. You can see those long shadows. The sun is shining in from the top. Objects that are a kilometer, up to a kilometer in size, are casting shadows one to three kilometers long. And a good analogy for this is imagine you're trying to look for the pyramids on Earth from the space station. And if you look around noon, it's going to be hard to see them against the background because their shadows will be very short. But if you look at dawn or dusk, the equivalent of equinox, you'll see that they cast very long shadows in the same way. That's how we could reveal some of the three-dimensional structures in Saturn's rings. We saw their places. Some of the strongest density waves have cast shadows. Those tiny moons cast shadows. Some of these other waves called bending waves also cast shadows in the rings. We also noticed in the end of 2013 that there was this bright spot along the edge of the A ring. And it told us that there was a, an object there that was disturbing the ring particles. And it turns out that Carl Murray discovered this object. And he discovered it on his mother-in-law's birthday. And her name was Peggy. So he nicknamed this object after her. And we've been watching Peggy ever since. And we even took some pictures on the very last day of the mission. And it appears that Peggy is still there. We're wondering, would, would Peggy break free and become a moon or be torn apart? And so here's kind of one of the larger objects in the rings that we've been watching very carefully. This is the Saturnian system of satellites. There are a total of 62 moons currently in orbit around Saturn. Many of those are irregular moons, probably captured objects out near the orbit of Phoebe, which itself is a captured object. You can see Titan is the largest of those. And in size, Titan is about the size of the planet Mercury. It's only about 40% of the mass. It's much lighter than Mercury. But had Titan formed elsewhere in the solar system, it could have been a planet in its own right. I think this moon is totally fascinating. It's Iapetus. Iapetus has one side that's as dark as charcoal, and the other as bright as snow. And we had known about this for a long time. The question from Voyager was the dark material coming from outside or from inside of Iapetus itself. And it turns out that Iapetus is being coated with, of all things, Phoebe dust. And that the dark side of Iapetus is just sweeping up that dust, and, and it gives it that, that color. What you really notice is this like belly band or walnut shape from Iapetus. And you know, one wonders, perhaps an oblate Iapetus was rotating quickly, and then maybe that froze into place. Or maybe Iapetus had a ring. And what you're seeing is as that ring decayed, it fell onto the equator and created that ridge. And it's quite long. It's over 2,000 kilometers long. It's over 20 kilometers high. In some places, you'll notice it's broken up by craters. So that ridge is quite old and quite fascinating. Another one of the things that uh, we noticed with Cassini. Here are some of the tiny ring moons uh, that orbit around Saturn. Atlas orbits just outside the A ring in that very narrow gap. Right here in the Keeler gap is Daphnis. And in the Enki gap, where you can see the bright ringlet here, uh, that's where Pan orbits. And if you look at these moons, they don't look like your typical moon. You'll notice that they all have skirts of material, these ridges of material around them. They're accumulating ring particles. They're close enough to the rings to actually accumulate them. If you look carefully at Daphnis, it appears to maybe even have two ridges uh, that are part of it. 
And these ridges can only grow to a certain size until finally the gravity of the moon loses out to Saturn. So it fills what we call its Roche lobe. And they can't really grow any bigger, but very different characteristics. Pan looks like a rigid ridge. You can actually see little craters on the, that, that ridge around Pan, whereas Atlas is much softer and looks much fluffier. They're probably central, more dense bodies or shards, and then that ring, those ring particles have created essentially a rubble pile around each of these very interesting moons. They're very underdense, very porous objects. This is another one of my favorite pictures. Here's Daphnis actually opening up uh, the Keeler gap. You can see it's pulled a tiny shred of ring material very close to it and also created this very beautiful wave along the edge of that gap. And on that third wavelength, the furthest away from Daphnis, it almost looks like that, that wave is separating from the ring itself. So it really creates and stirs up the particles. And again, this might be an analogy for what could have happened in the protoplanetary disk as you opened up gaps in that disk. Uh, this is Titan. Uh, this is the Voyager view of Titan. Titan's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, but also there's about 1.6% methane. That methane is broken apart in the upper atmosphere and goes on to create a photochemical smog. And so Voyager didn't carry any instruments that could see through this smog to the surface of Titan. And so immediately in the early 1980s after the Voyager flyby, scientists got together and said, we need to go back and try and better understand what's happening on Titan. So that's why one of the reasons we carried the Huygens probe. And here's an artist's concept of the Huygens probe. It was released on December 25th, 2004, and arrived on January 14th, 2005. Uh, Cassini was diverted, so we didn't want to follow the Huygens probe into Titan's atmosphere. Uh, the heat shield slowed down the probe until finally uh, the parachute cup could come out. It took two and a half hours to slowly float down to the surface. We actually had to go to a smaller parachute partway to get down a little bit faster. And then we soft landed on the surface of Titan. And here's a movie, the last 10 kilometers. We carried a camera uh, that we could look as the probe was rotating and took a series of images. We could see ridges and what looked like mountains. If you look off to the right, it looks like river channels uh, flowing on Titan itself. Uh, it took quite a while to actually pierce through the haze and be able to see all the way through to the surface. It turns out that we landed in a dry uh, stream bed or perhaps river bed. And here you can see some of the rounded icy pebbles that told us that liquid was flowing on the surface of Titan. And it turns, and here's another view of, taken by the Huygens probe. Turns out that methane plays the role on Titan, that water plays on the Earth. You can have methane clouds, methane rain, and methane can create the river channels and fill the lakes and seas. Here's the surface again. And if you look at that central image in color, you can see we had a lamp that could help us understand the color of the surface and, and give us an understanding of what we were seeing. Uh, the illumination here is the equivalent of about 10 minutes after sunset down on the surface of Titan. And over on the far right, clear evidence of those river channels that are flowing on Titan. Now, if you look very carefully at this image at the North Pole of Titan, you'll see those dark splotches. Those are the seas that were present on Titan. Turns out that Titan's North Pole was in darkness, but we could see them first with our radar instrument. It was very best at penetrating the haze and helping us map out the surface. But the visible and infrared mapping spectrometer had uh, windows in methane windows. They could see the surface, as could the cameras now with their methane filters in the near infrared. And so here's a specular reflection. It was our first evidence, the smoking gun, that those seas were filled with a liquid. In this case, mostly liquid methane. And here's a view of one of those seas, Ligia Mare. Here's Ligia Mare. It's about 50% larger than Lake Superior. Uh, with our radar instruments, we got a reflection not only from the top of the sea, but a faint reflection from the bottom as well. And so 100 to 200 meters deep, we actually got a profile across the bottom of Ligia Mare. And if you average together all of the hydrocarbons in those seas alone at the North Pole, it's about 100 times the amount of hydrocarbons that we have here on the Earth. We also saw long linear dune features in the equatorial region, evidence of mountains and perhaps with cryovolcanic flows. In this case, water would be the lava that would flow, perhaps mixed with ammonia on Titan, clouds, and also the view of the surface itself. 
And here's another view of those clouds in the cameras and then that image on the bottom right, that's from the visual and infrared mapping spectrometer. You can see a specular reflection and the methane in the yellow and then that methane cloud that's visible. So we actually monitored the weather and we had a, a good talk by Zibi today about the clouds and the weather and actually seeing part of the t surface of Titan wet by the rain there. Moving on to Enceladus, Enceladus is of only about one-tenth the size of Titan. It's only 500 kilometers across, and yet when you look at the surface, you, you notice those are four linear fractures near the south, south Pole. We nicknamed them Tiger Stripes. You'll notice there are no craters in the Tiger Stripe region. When Voyager flew by Enceladus, the South Pole was in darkness, and so we missed the Tiger Stripes. And oh, something fascinating uh, that we really would have told us a lot about Enceladus. Turns out that our first evidence that Enceladus was active came from our magnetometer team, that Enceladus looked more comet-like than, than it did like an airless body. And so they encouraged us to fly closer. On the third flyby, we came within 175 kilometers of Enceladus and noticed an excess of heat with our composite infrared spectrometer. And that excess heat was coming out of those four linear tiger stripes. Here's a view of one of those tiger stripes. They're about 130 kilometers long, about 35 kilometers apart, typically about two kilometers wide. There's a lot of tectonic fracturing and activity at the South Pole. And it turns out that coming out of these tiger stripes are jets of material and gases creating a giant plume of material out of the South Pole of Enceladus. And the cameras mapped over 100 individual jet sources coming out of these particular fractures. Here's another view where you can start to see the individual jets, perhaps even curtains of material coming out from Enceladus. When we flew through and actually sampled those grains, the cosmic dust analyzer measured salts that looked like it was seawater, salty sodium and potassium equivalent to the seawater on the Earth. And then the ion neutral mass spectrometer measured the gases coming out carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane. If you think about it, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, in this ocean coming out from the vents of Enceladus are the key ingredients that you could have for life. Well, it turns out there's an Enceladus on the Earth as well. It's a fountain. Uh, this is a fountain uh, in Versailles' garden. Uh, turns out Enceladus was a giant, and he got into a bit of trouble uh, with Athena, and so she banished him to Mount Etna, and so here he is trying to fight his way out of Mount Etna with this huge stream of water coming out of his mouth. And who, who would have guessed, you know, how accurate that might be for the Enceladus <laughs> in our solar system. Well, the, most of the grains fall back to Enceladus's surface, but the tiniest grains go out and create, like wispy fingers, create the E-ring. That dark dot is Enceladus, that bright splotch beneath it is the plume coming out, and this creates the E-ring, and it turns out the E-ring is densest at Enceladus's orbit, but the E-ring goes all the way into the main rings and all the way out to the orbit of Titan, coats one of the sides of the icy satellites, and is really a major player in the water-dominated magnetosphere as well. Well, Enceladus has a global ocean, and we know from our radar gravi radio science gravity measurements that there's an ocean under the South Pole, and the excess libration measured in the 10 years of the images told us you needed to decouple the core from the crust, and an ocean was the way to do that. It turns out we also saw evidence of hydrothermal vents on the seafloor. Tiny nanosilica grains measured by the cosmic dust analyzer could only form in water close to the boiling point. And then there was an excess of hydrogen, another characteristic of hydrothermal vents. Now we know about hydrothermal vents from the Earth deep in the seafloor with their seafloor spreading, this is a place where hot water goes into the crust of the Earth, picks up minerals. When it comes back out and hits the cold water, you get what looks like smoke. And these are white smokers. They're also black smokers on the Earth. Deep, deep in the Earth's oceans, no sunlight. And yet when you look close to one of these hydrothermal vents, you have an oasis of life. You have tiny crabs and tube worms and, and life of all sorts that uses the heat energy and the nutrients coming out of these hydrothermal vents. So it makes us wonder, could there perhaps be life in the ocean on Enceladus? Now, unfortunately, Cassini didn't carry any instruments. We had no idea Enceladus would be active. So it will take a future mission to go back to answer that question. But we now know there are ocean worlds like Enceladus and Europa, 
Titan also has a liquid water ocean, so maybe these worlds are more abundant. And I wonder about Neptune's moon Triton. Could it have an ocean as well? Well, Cassini's grand finale was that final set of 22 orbits, and it was our chance to say goodbye. Cassini spacecraft was running out of fuel, and so we wanted to make sure that we didn't accidentally, once out of fuel, crash into one of these ocean worlds. You know, it, it would be a shame to go back to Enceladus and look for life, and what do we find? Earth microbes, because Cassini crashed there. So we wanted to make sure uh, not to do that. Here are those orbits. The gray orbits are ring grazing orbits. We pulled the periaps in very close to the F ring, got excellent views of the A ring and outer B ring. The grand finale orbits, we actually dove in between the rings and the planet. A single Titan flyby propelled us all the way across Saturn's rings into the gap between the rings and the planet. We were at about an inclination of 62 degrees to keep the periaps stable so it didn't rotate in the, in the planet's plane. Here are just a couple of those findings. This is a camera view. If you look at the red dot, that's where the images are being taken. Here we're seeing little snippets of Saturn's atmosphere at resolutions much higher than we've ever seen before. We're taking pictures as fast as we can, and so they're just in black and white. There we actually turned the spacecraft on the first orbit to use the high gain antenna as a shield because we didn't know if the particles would be a danger to the spacecraft. It turns out they were all tiny nanograins and Cassini was completely safe to fly through them. Here's a view of some of those clouds, little wispy clouds in Saturn's atmosphere. One of the atmospheric scientists said, you know, I've never seen anything quite like this on Saturn or any of the giant planets before. So it's really fun, this new, brand new mission at the end to be part of that discovery process. Just some gravity results briefly. This is the uh, value of the coefficients as a function of degree. You can think of it as J234. The red is uniform rotation, what we were expecting. Jupiter falls along these red points for its coefficients. And yet Saturn, when you get to J8 and J10, are much higher values than expected. And this was a big surprise. Actually, J3 and J5 were also larger. A filled symbol is positive. An open symbol is a negative value. So what that's telling us is that the, the rotation that we see expressed and you can look at the, the, the jets going you know, eastward or westward, it's going much deeper into the planet than we had expected. We know from Juno results at Jupiter that the that depth of that flow is about 3,000 kilometers. It's a few times that at Saturn, so really a surprising result how deeply those flows go inside of Saturn. Uh, the big puzzle was the mass of the rings because that had something, you know, tells us about the age of the rings. Again, from our gravity measurements, it uh, turns out that you know, with the uncertainty went from about 100% down to something a little bit less than the Voyager value of 0.75 that minus masses. If you could scoop up all of Saturn's main ring particles, they'd, they'd be about the mass, uh, three quarters of the mass, or a little bit less than that than, than minus. And this told us the rings had to be young. It was many, one of many lines of evidence. But it looks like the rings are only maybe on the order of a few hundred million years old. And as Jeff Cuzzy said today, maybe they formed about the time of the dinosaurs, you know, if you think about it. So on the scheme of things, Saturn's rings are quite young. And maybe an object got too close to Saturn and broke apart. We're having to re-examine what's happening in the Saturn system. We also heard this morning that the moons in the Saturn system are not like the Jovian satellites, which get denser or less dense as you go further away, but they're very chaotic in how they're differentiated and how dense they are. Maybe something happened around this time that formed the rings and did something with the satellites in the Saturn system. Maybe some of those are quite young as well. This is a really wonderful view of the C ring. It's something we've never seen at this resolution before. It's just absolutely incredible all the different kinds of structure that you see in one of these searing plateaus. Streaky structure with maybe gaps in there. What you've taken in that band is you've subtracted out the uniform structure, and what you're left with is the irregular structure. Clumpy material that looks kind of like straw, places where all of a sudden there's no texture, and then streaky structure. And so we have a lot of brand new puzzles from this last uh, set of orbits of the mission. And finally, here's our farewell view of Saturn. Two days before we impacted into the planet, we took this mosaic of images in color and as our sort of our final farewell. This is what Saturn looked like before Cassini went in, into the planet. 
And on September 15th, the Cassini family was there. Here's a, a group of us, uh, you know, waving, you know, waving goodbye to Saturn. And for me, it was very special, too, because my daughters came to visit. And there's Jessica, Jennifer, and my granddaughter, Audrey. So they were all there for Cassini's final event. Now, if you're a big fan of Disneyland, uh, you might remember the days when you had to have paper tickets to go on the rides. Well, I would say the 13 years of the Cassini mission, this epic journey at Saturn, is certainly an e-ticket ride. <laughs> oh, and then what I want to do is I want to just share with you a movie uh, in closing uh, that we showed just after Cassini had gone into Saturn. And it's a wonderful walk down memory lane of some of the things that we saw with Cassini. Thank you very much. When I see that movie, I think, I want to go back. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Unfortunately, we have to reconfigure the rooms for the next session. So uh, if you have any questions, please catch Linda in the hall. But thank you. It was a wonderful talk about phenomenal okay. mission.